So we've had a lot of requests. One of them was about our optical comparator and how we make it and what do we do, what parts of it do we make? Well, we have a lot of buy items. We don't make everything, but we certainly do make most of the mechanical things. In fact, almost all of them. We obviously don't make the controller and we don't make the bulbs and we don't make the lenses and so forth of the screen. Those are all buy items. Another one that is a buy item of ours is the cabinet. We're not in the sheet metal business. We are in the manufacturing business of, of changing metal, but not sheet metals. So we called Carlson Metal Products and we talked to John Martin and he's agreed to have us come out there on a field trip and show you how the sheet metal is made. It's quite a process. It's, uh, it, this will be my first time there. So uh, my staff has been out there a number of times, but I haven't been there. So just to give you an idea, this cabinet, the fascia, this box, table, there's a whole lot of sheet metal uh, that they have to fabricate from the raw and paint it and provide it to us. So we're going to take a field trip out there right now and show you how it's done. I'm excited about going there because I want to see it myself. So Jim, let's pack it up and let's roll. Alright, so we're here with John Martin. And John, if you would be so kind as to show us our first operation here on one of the products that you make for us. Okay, we're going to punch a uh, Suburban Shroud which goes to your optical comparator. It's the main part of the optical comparator. Uh, we're going to put it into our Amada um, Vipros turret press and it's actually going to punch out the shroud shape and all the holes that go along with it. And wait a minute, who's going to do it? No, oh, this is Brenda Fernandez. Okay, Brenda do it. All right, Brenda. <laughs> How long does this operation take typically? Uh, it depends on the comp, you know how comp complex the part is, um, how many holes are in the part. But this is probably about a 30 second uh, punching job. Wow, that's pretty quick, 30 seconds. There's 56 tools in that turret. A lot of them stay in there all the time and then other ones we, we put in you know, per job. Yeah, so you got standard tools in there and then you put special tools on a yep. as needed basis. You can punch a round hole, square hole, rectangle, trapezoid. Um, we can punch a round disc with a square punch. Wow, that's very cool. And it holds all, holds all dimensions within two thousandths of an inch. Wow. It'll do about 120 hits per minute. That's awesome. I don't know if you saw at the beginning there, it auto repositioned the clamps like just now, it just did that again. It, it holds ah. the part down, repositions the clamps. Yeah, I wonder what the hydraulic clamp was over here on this corner. Is that the hydraulic clamp on the corner there? Yep. yep. The machine has different speeds depending on the thickness of the material, the complexity of the part. We can, what speed do you have it? You have it, it's fast. It's not as fast as mode right now. How about maintenance on the machine? A lot of maintenance on it? We do monthly maintenance on it uh, ourselves. We also have Amada come in and do preventive maintenance on it every six months where they change the hydraulic fluid, they grease the whole machine. Huh. All of our machinery throughout the whole shop is on a pretty strict preventive maintenance. Huh. There you go. There's a finished uh, punch part. Awesome. You got a shot of that, Jim? Brenda, thank you. On to the next station, right? Yep. All right. I see. Uh, Brenda gets her workout every day. I see why you wear gloves. <laughs> Beautiful. Very cool. Okay, John, can you give us an idea of what we're doing here? Yeah, typically when a part comes out of the turret, we, we literally shake it out of the blank that it was in and discard the, the frame or the scrap. We bring the part in here and this is our first inspection point uh, during the process of manufacturing. This is a, a FabriVision machine. It's got six cameras mounted on the inside there. We lay the flat piece down on the screen here. We run the scan over the top and it tells us that we have the correct tooling in the turret. It tells us that uh, all the programming that we did to make the part is correct. And it'll give us an image up there on the monitor and it will tell us it's color coded. So we know if we see something in red, 
there's an issue. Either a tool got loaded wrong or something might be wrong in the program or there might just be a big burr on the part. So Paul's going to go ahead and scan that. So this really proofs, I don't mean to interrupt you, but this really proofs the part that, uh, that it's made the way it should be. Yeah, if we're going to punch 500 chassis or covers or boxes or whatever, we want to make sure everything is correct before uh, we makes in sense. invest any more into that product. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, you want to produce 500 pieces of scrap. Exactly. And we, we check ourselves throughout the whole operation, but this is our first one. We make sure that all the fab, you know, all the fabricated holes are correct. So I, is it it's looking at it right now? It's scanning it, right? Scanning right now. And then we'll, uh, an image will show up on the monitor there in a minute. <clears throat> so that tells if they did a good job out here, right, Paul? Correct. All right. And whether Paul did a good job programming. Or whether you did, yeah, because you do the programming, right? I started off It's very cool. Yeah, this is a part of the business that we don't know anything about. You know, we're in the manufacturing side, but nothing like this. So this is all new to us. And we think for our viewers, it's going to be very cool for them to be able to see how this process is, is done. Yes, it is. I mean, quality is such a huge part of our business right now. Uh, you got to make sure everything is you know right on the money as far as dimensions go and it doesn't matter how you orient the, the orientate the part it's uh other than the fact you don't want to have a straight line because it, it'll ignore the straight line and you'll have a big blank spot. ah i see so you put it on an angle for that yeah pretty cool so sort of like an x-ray but not an x-ray <laughs> right he's going to pick once the image pops up there on the monitor he'll pick two points on that part. It picks up everything. Scratches, dust. Dirt. So does it actually show if there's a uh, an imperfection or something that's not quite right? Yes, it will. Once I compare the two files, which is like laying one on top of the other one. I see. It will have, it's color coded as to any variance that uh, I Okay. Excuse me, sir. Hold back just a little bit. So now you merge the uh, the program with the part, then it tells you if there's a variance. Is that the idea? Yep. Correct. And because it's color coded, we know if everything shows up in blue or light blue, dark blue, that's a good part. If, like I said earlier, if there's all of a sudden we see some red on there, then we know there's something we you got need a to, problem that you, yeah, then you take go, a look at. Then you either <coughs> check Paul's work, or you check the work out here, right? right. Paul's not the problem, though. No, he's already confirmed that. <laughs> um, I'm going to stay negative on that one right now. So that's there. You just merged it, right? Correct. That's the big one on top of the other. The lighter blues indicate that everything is within the tolerance. That can all be inspected individually. These little red specks along the outside edges are actually specks of dirt on the glass. I see. Or a scratch, or if it was close to the edge, it would actually be burned. And they would be checked out. So that's given us a real quick visual that that's a good part right there. Beautiful. So we can uh, then go ahead and punch right. the rest of them and move on. Let's go punch the other 500. All right. So, John, where are we now? Now we're moved over to our forming operation, which is our uh, Amata press brakes. Uh, we have two of them. They're both 50 ton, can handle up to a six foot long piece. Um, the nice thing about these brakes are they have programmable back gauges. So we program all the bends in there, put the tooling in, and then the back gauges move in and out to adjust for the bend. So you're only handling the part one time. Wow, that's pretty cool. So the guys are lining up the they have a mark somewhere? On yeah, the they have a mark on the die and there's fingers on the back that they're butting up against to make sure they get the right uh, spot. No? No. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're lining it up for so that. So you line it up to... Right. right. So you line it up to certain points? Correct. We, we put notches into the, oh, I see. Okay. Into the part for uh, the bending. So we're lining those up. So if they get the, they don't get it lined up just right, there's a problem with the part. You might as well throw it out, I assume. Correct. Yep. 
The other nice part about these brakes is they're up acting brakes. So if you happen to get your fingers in there, you can take your foot off the pedal and the, and the bottom die drops down and you're not going to pinch your fingers. I see. Whereas a down acting brake, you get your fingers in it, you have to cycle it through to ah. get your hand out of there. Yeah, that's not good. So, so it's, I a, it's a nice safety feature. They, so they're sliding something back and forth, like putting it in a notch. Is yep. that the idea? Exactly. Yep. Now they're going to turn the part around and do the same thing on the other side. Now do you brush this material or is it, does it come in that way? No, we actually run it through a sanding machine uh, while it's still in the flat. That deburs all the edges, all the holes, takes, you know, and it puts a nice grain finish into the material. And which is nice for what are the, the final coating yeah. is, whether it be paint, powder, anodized, um, you know, zinc plating. It makes it for a nice substrate for the final coat. It seemed to me that the paint would stick better, obviously. It does, yep, it does. And it also, on aluminum, sometimes just the grain finish uh, is the final finish. It takes out all the imperfections out of the metal, any scratches that might be in the metal. Yeah, like one more bend to do and that's it. Boy, it's a uh, kind of tedious work. And two guys have to be very careful what they're doing. Even getting it out. Yep. Voila, there we go. And that's it for the a forming sh operation. Shroud. So there we have the cutting and now we have the forming. Correct. That's and we would be inspecting those, you know, dimensionally as we go along also. So we're kind of checking ourselves right. on each step of the process. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, so, John, where are we now? Now we're over into our welding department, and we're going to start actually putting the whole uh, optical comparator together. We're going to do a little bit of MIG welding and a little bit of TIG welding on it. We've got it all clamped, ready to go, uh, and we're ready to uh, start welding. Bob's going to take over, right Bob? Alright. An amazing amount of handwork involved. Yep. You said your business is very labor intensive, so, so is ours. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, everything is, uh, it's just... We'd love to have customers come through and let me give them the tour, especially if they're not familiar with sheet metal fabrication, so they can see the process and then better understand where the pricing comes from and sure. you know the difficulties in maintaining quality. Now Bob just changed uh, uh, welders. Right. The he first one was a, a... Was a MIG welder. MIG welder. Yep. This and now he's in the TIG welding. welding. And what's the difference between MIG and TIG? MIG is a little faster, uh, you know, when the, when the weld doesn't have to be aesthetically that nice. I mean, they both hold together very well, but, uh, you know, the outside we do a little MIG welding, or TIG welding, in the more critical areas that have yeah, to look aesthetic, yeah, well. right. Okay. That one does not, does not feed a wire through it, correct? The TIG weld? Right. Correct. You, either, you can either fuse weld by melding the two pieces of metal together, sure. or you can add some uh, uh, TIG rod to it. I see. And then the MIG has a wire feed going to it. Just spotting it here, it looks like. Yeah, just putting it. tack welds to hold it all together. And he can remove his clamps and. Correct, yep. There we go. And then what we'll do is after we get it all welded together, we'll take it over to the metal finish area and we'll grind down the welds, smooth them all out, and awesome. prep the part and get it ready for paint, which is the next operation. Beautiful. Well, I know you guys have done a great job for us. You've made hundreds of these for us and uh, never had an issue with them. So.
We thank you for that. That's good to hear. And that's about it for that's the water. All right. Hey, thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. All set. All right, so John, give us a rough idea of what's going on here. Okay, we've got the the shroud all welded together now. We've metal finished it. We put put it through the vapor degreaser to clean all the metal and prep it for painting. We brought it in and we painted the inside black and baked it. Then we wash primed the outside, which gives a better adhesion for the black paint to go on. Um, and now he's getting ready to apply the, the carbide black um, polyurethane enamel on the outside. So why did you do the inside separately as a, a separate process? It just makes it easier to handle. Well, that's true. I, I see. So he's just finishing up the... the he, we do it upside down when we paint the inside. So he's just finishing the little touch up here on the inside. Got it. The inside not being, uh, you know, visually critical. And, and tell me about the type of paint that you're using. It's a two-part... Uh, polyurethane enamel. It has a hardener added to it and then we, we reduce it down to make it sprayable. But it's very durable paint. What we do is we spray the base coat on, which is what Ken's doing right now. Once we get the, the base coat completely on there, we let it flash dry for 15 minutes. Then we go back and we put a texture coat on. Okay. Which, with, with a pressure pot and a different spray gun. The texture coat hides imperfections again in the metal, uh, makes the paint much more durable. We don't really reduce the texture coat down with just paint. So it, go, it, and it just gives it a, a nice, uh, similar to like a, the finish on the refrigerator. So did you say that uh, this type of paint was sort of like an, uh, it's a two-part process, a two-part paint, right? Right, yeah, there's a hardener in it. And it's a, uh, it's a polyurethane, polyurethane enamel, yep. Very good product, been using it for many, many, many years. I see you use a pressure pot which allows your gun to go upside down, side well, no, that, and all that's that. That's actually what we use for the texture coat. I we see. actually use a suction feed uh, for the spraying of the base coat. Ah. But the fact that there's no pot at the end of the gun gives them full flexibility rotating Correct. The, yep. the gun upside down, backwards, yep. and so forth. That's great. Get a lot of puts out a lot of paint, doesn't it? Yes, it does. We have uh, Kremlin guns, which are really they have a high transfer efficiency rate, so you're not not a whole lot of paints going into the filter. Ninety six percent of the paints going onto the part. That's great. So we're not wasting a lot of paint. So is that because of the type of gun? Type of gun, type of nozzle that we use. So you've got to get your air pressure just right and the, and the paint just right, Correct. right thickness. Yep. And then after this, you put the texture on. We'll let it. We'll let it flash dry for 15 minutes. Usually, we have a whole roll of parts in here. Yeah. We'll, we'll bake them. He'll go over and do another one over there and come back and then texture over here. Then we'll put them on the racks. We'll bake them at 140 degrees for 30 minutes. And then they're ready to package and ship to you guys. Beautiful. Love seeing it. It's about time I got over here. It's been uh, been a lot of years you've been doing this. Yeah, I would say we've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things. Yeah. So the apparatus that Bob is wearing, that's battery operated and keeps yeah, fresh air coming that's in. Keeping fresh air, him breathing fresh air, even though we have air makeup systems up on the roof that actually pump in more cubic feet of fresh air than these three booths can draw out at one time. We always have positive pressure in here so we're not drawing any dust out of the shop. That's got to be expensive in the winter time too. Yes it is because it's its own heat source. So. Sure, sure. And then it's and then your finished product. There you go. Well thanks again for taking us through the plant and showing us everything. It's been a real education. Thanks, thanks John. John. Appreciate it. There we go. Back to the office. Wow. I had no idea. I mean, I knew that making sheet metal, particularly these cabinets like this for us, was a complicated process, but I had no idea. So John took us through there and showed us every step, as you saw, about all the things that he does to make this thing happen. It's pretty exciting and it's pretty complicated. So when you really go out in the field and you see these sorts of things, you can really appreciate uh, the efforts and the talent and the talented people that he has to make this thing happen.
So we're going to be doing a couple of other trips out there to, with some of our vendors to show you uh, how they process some of the things that we buy. So we're looking forward to doing another video coming up shortly, uh, visiting with one of our vendors. And we want to thank you for watching. Keep those cards and letters coming. Thanks again.